to. Right. Yes. Breaking the wall to next generation Thank batteries. So How oh, fast charging batteries weapon. work and why they matter. Claire Gray, University of Cambridge. On November the 9th, 1989, I was starting my third year of my doctoral studies at Oxford University. and we work and we communicate from our mobile phones, our laptops, but also things that we don't think about. The robots that go out and stock the supermarket shelves, the robots in the sensors, and increasingly the robots that are going to make a difference to sustainability. So today is Science Day at COP26, and there we're worrying about how to shift the world away from coal to reduce pollution, to reduce carbon emissions, to make an impact and make a more sustainable future. So why do batteries play a role? Their first role that we all are familiar with is in electrification of transport, to use more renewables. These renewables, though, come with a problem of intermittency. So the sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't always blow, and we need to balance the demand with the usage. And so we need cheaper, safer, larger, and longer-lasting batteries for widespread adoption of electric vehicles and in the grid. But I want to touch on one particular area, and that's the area of battery charging. So I want to sort of imagine a world where you don't worry about having to charge your battery as you rush out of your house in the morning, or you rush to get a plane, or a train, or something more environmental, like an electric bicycle. Instead, we will have a battery that where we rethink the idea of charging. It isn't just about convenience. It's about rapid response on the grid, a more rapid response when the sun goes behind the cloud. It's about being able to build a smaller battery so that you go and you can charge it instantaneously or almost instantaneously and continue on your, your way without having to worry about the sustainability issues that bigger batteries bring with them. So I'll just walk you through very quickly what a lithium-ion battery is. So it's very simple. We have an anode on one side, a cathode on the other side, and when we charge, the lithium ions move through the electrolyte and intercalate. In, so this is in, in, the, in, the, in the highest, com most reactive components. So this is the lithiated graphite, and this is the fully charged cathode. And on the way back, when you're actually getting power out of the system, the lithiums go back and you get your electrons. So the question is, why can't we charge faster? So the picture I showed you was a static picture where the anodes and the cathodes were sitting able to absorb lithium ions without changing. But in practice, this is the cathode. When you're pulling lithiums in and out of the structures, so the lithiums are going back in again, the layers that form the cathodes expand and contract as the ions come in and out. And when the layers are nicely expanded, the lithium ions can move, and you can watch the lithium mobility go up and down as your layers go up, and as your layers contract, they clamp the lithiums in place so the lithium ions can no longer move. Now, why does that matter? We all know have an analogy of a toaster, the electrons moving through the wires and heating up. It's the same thing with our batteries. If we can't move the electrons, we can't move the lithium ions fast enough, we get a lot of heating. And this heating triggers a whole series of degradation processes. At the cathode, it results in the degradation of the cathode, the release in oxygen, which causes safety incidents, and transformations of structures so that they can no longer receive and release the lithium ions. The problem is worse at the anode. Your graphite only survives because of a passivating layer 
on top of it, a bit like rust forms on top of a metal, and that protects your highly lithiated graphite from the electrolyte around it. If you use your laptop on your lap, or you put your mobile phone in a hot place, and it gets above 60 degrees centigrade, that passivation layer decomposes. And what that then means is that the highly reactive anode continues to react with the electrolyte, and it forms more passivating layers. The rust gets thicker and thicker, it consumes more and more lithiums, and the problem gets worse. So that's problem two. Problem three is also got to do with the lithium ions, and specifically when you insert the lithium ions into the graphite. If we do that very fast, they don't insert, insert nicely in these graphitic layers. They form these mossy structures, or lithium dendrites. And while they look very beautiful, uh, beautiful, and this is one of my research areas where we characterize these materials, they also, if they short circuit, can result in the fires and explosions that sometimes one sees for lithium ion batteries. These dendrites also are highly reactive. They again react with the electrolyte, and they consume more lithiums. And so if one thing that we do in my work is to use lithium NMR spectroscopy, which is very similar to the methods that are used in hospitals in MRI spectroscopy. In hospitals, you look at the protons, you look at the water. I look at the lithium NMR, and I follow what's going on at the cathode and the graphite. And what you're seeing are the signatures of the lithiums coming out of the cathode and going into the graphite. But if we go to lower temperatures, so a cold day in Germany, a cold day in many parts of the world, you can see the signatures of this lithium metal formation. And it's this lithium metal formation that stops you from doing regenerative breaking faster. It stops you from take, making use of all of the energy from, um, that you get when you break a car. So how do we design for fast charging? So we need, first of all, to find a material that is slightly less reactive than lithium inside graphite. And so for the scientists in the room, that means you lift the voltage a little bit above zero volts. Then we need to find a material that's got lots of holes in it. So a bit like a sponge that can absorb and release lithium ions. And one of the materials that does that very well is called a perovskite. And these materials contain these octahedra of metals and oxygens and holes. And you can move them, you can move lithiums around in them, except for one problem. When I put a lithium in this structure, not only do I insert a lithium ion, I insert an electron. And that changes the, the metal oxygen distances. And what that structure does is it rotates and it clamps that lithium in place. And so that lithium no longer has that nice open channel. Instead, it's fully clamped there. And so you have, again, this very high resistance associated with moving lithiums in and out of the structure. So what we did was to take this structure and said, let's put pillars to hold the structure up. And you can do that via something called a shear, where I remove these oxygens and I literally move the layers together and I form this column. So a bit like you might, in a, a back operation, fuse your spine together to limit your mobility and in sometimes save issues of slipped discs. And, but we can do better than that. We can put columns in one direction, and we can also, I'm going to have to say this, we can also build walls in two directions. But our walls are there for stability. Our walls are there to stop the structures collapsing. And so when we do that, and then we searched around all types of materials with these types of structures, particularly looking at materials of tungsten, titanium, and niobium, we came up with a series of or classes of structures with these so-called block structures, so the niobium tungsten oxides. And this was work of my former PhD student, Kent Griffiths, who spent almost five to six years unpicking all of this, and then eventually found this material that was able to come up with capacity and a three-minute charge with very little reduction in the overall capacity. So capacity is the number of electrons you can get out of a unit amount of material. And this material was able to, in the first iteration, cycle for 500 times. So that's more than a year with only a very small decrease in capacity. 
So why does it work? Ultimately, we're fundamental scientists, and so we want to unpick the mechanisms that make these materials operate so well. And the technique that we use is called pulse field gradient NMR spectroscopy. So I put a magnet, but a gradient of magnetic field across my batteries, and then if I look at the signal and I watch how it decays, I can quantify the diffusion coefficient of these materials. So my lithium ions are moving with diffusion coefficients of 10 to the minus 11 to 10 to the minus 13 meters per second. Now I imagine for most of you that number has absolutely no meaning. So what I want to do in the next slide is walk you through what that number means. So if I'm going to try and do a three minute charge and I'm a liquid electrolyte, the ions in a liquid move with a diffusion coefficient of about 10 to the minus 10. And so in that three minute charge, they can move a third of a millimeter. And that's about the thickness of a typical lithium ion electrode. So they can move from the anode to the cathode in the three minute charge. Our materials, the lithium ions can move 33 microns. So not as much, but enough. And that means that we can use these big particles of our materials. So our materials are about five microns in size. That means we don't have to nano-size our materials. There's a lot of discussion in the world about nano-sizing, and it's assumed to be good, but the pra in practice, a nanomaterial has a very high surface area, and it can react with the electrolyte and the batteries degrade. So we can use big materials, and we can do a three-minute charge. And you can see the graphite, which is the commercial material, the equivalent, in the equivalent time, the lithium ions have only moved 1 33rd of the distance. So if that was difficult to follow, we can also use optical microscopy to look at it. And what you're looking at is a new method called ISCAT, not a great name, it wasn't my invention, but the work of Alice Merriweather, my PhD student, together with my colleague Akshay Rao, to use optical microscopy to watch the lithium ions moving out of these structures. And they're doing it so fast that we can capture it in these optical images. And you can watch the lithium ions coming down these tunnel structures without the layers collapsing. So what does this mean? What we've been able to do is to spin the, the work out into a small startup company called Niobolt. And what you're watching is a 30 sec 100 second charge. The battery wasn't heating up and is going off to do to its work in a robot. So let's just watch this video again. This is the heat map as the battery is being charged in 100 seconds. Yes the battery is heating up because it's physically impossible not to put, if you put energy through the system, it will heat up. But it's importantly, it's re remaining below that temperature that's so critical that was, is the onset of battery degradation. And we've now been able to demonstrate these batteries with traditional cathode materials and next generation materials and have demonstrated a startup. With, uh, sorry, we've demonstrated a battery for our startup. So I want you to return now to reimagine that world and think about what fast charging does mean for us. And as I said, it isn't just about our convenience. It's about the idea that we might be able to have a smaller battery in a car. So at the moment, larger manufacturer, car manufacturers are going for bigger batteries so that they give you the range so you don't have range anxiety. But if you have the confidence that your battery will charge fast, you may be able to tolerate the smaller battery and the more sustainable battery. But I want to end by saying fundamental science is really still needed in this area to drive the change from the lab all the way through to the market. And I think that is very much in the spirit of the conference. And so thank you very much for listening to me.